In this reading, which we have just heard, a reading that is very familiar to us as Catholics, Jesus distinguishes himself from other shepherds, shepherds of the past and the present in particular, and for that matter, implicitly shepherds of the future. The image of the religious leadership over God's people, the Israelites, is often reflected in the Old Covenant period as that of shepherd, one who watches over the covenant people of God as a shepherd watches over his sheep. But as we know, much of the leadership was thoroughly corrupted by the time of Christ and in times past in the history of the Israelites, there had been periods of very wicked shepherds and God's people had been misled and God's people suffered as a consequence. Wicked shepherds mislead the faithful, but it is no excuse for the faithful to allow themselves to be misled. At any rate, when Jesus describes himself as the Good Shepherd, that is a singular title that can be said only of Christ. It's not simply an adjective to distinguish good from bad. It does that, but it is more. When he says, I am the Good Shepherd, as in other instances when he describes himself by other I am identifiers, I am the gate to the sheepfold, I am the true vine, I am the living water, I am the way and the truth and the life. Those I am statements, which in itself is an expression of divinity, gives this title uh, and this uh, role to Christ exclusively. Though others may share and participate in it, it is all a participation in Christ, the Good Shepherd. And Christ distinguishes other features of this uh, allegory, if you will. It's not simply a parable, it's an allegory. Of course, the faithful are the sheep, or the sheepfold would be the church. And then he speaks about uh, the wolf or the wolves. Those would be those who are doing the work of Satan or Satan himself, seeking to steal away the faithful. And the hirelings. Hirelings are those who should be shepherds, true shepherds, but instead, rather than the willingness to lay down their lives for their sheep as the good shepherd did, uh, they flee the sign of danger. At any rate, I'd like to apply this allegory to what has been happening recently in the church, even as recently as just a few days ago. Many of you are probably aware that an open letter has been written and signed and posted by a number of uh, theologians, many of them quite prominent and highly respected, and not all of them traditional Catholics as such, uh, an open letter has been written, signed, and posted addressed to the bishops worldwide, the bishops of the Catholic Church. This letter is not addressed to Francis. It's not addressed to simply to cardinals. It is addressed to bishops not priests as such, not deacons, bishops. Why bishops? Because the bishops, as we all know, are all successors of the apostles. And so they have a very specific and sacramental role, pastoral role to play that includes authority in the life of the church. Priests are not 
successors of the apostles in the fullest sense the bishops are. And this open letter accuses Francis of Rome of uh, speaking and writing and representing with his actions various heresies. That is um, something which is contrary to a known truth of religion. I'm not going to get into all the details of which, uh, what each of the seven heresies are, but they relate to such matters as sexual morality, the sacraments, and the matter in which we are justified or made right with God related to uh, sin and grace. Very much focused upon these areas. The point is, they are not claiming that Francis has, uh, shall we say, exercised, or in the exercise of his capacity to declare something infallibly, um, made a heretical statement, but in his uh, ordinary capacity of uh, teaching in matters of faith and morals, they accuse him of heresy. Uh, including in what he has written in encyclicals, in what he has said in public statements and addresses and sermons and homilies and so on. Frankly, if Christ's protection upon the office of the Pope applied only to matters that are formally declared to be infallible, well, there's not a whole lot of work for Christ to do in that regard because more popes than not have never made such declarations. And some would say that fewer than a dozen times has it been done in the entire history of the church. So what about what is more ordinary uh, with regards to the exercise of the papal office when a pope would speak heretically or write heretically, or act in matters which would uh, mislead the faithful in matters of faith and morals. For instance, uh, making statements that suggest that uh, sexual perversion is not uh, mortally sinful or might be an acceptable matter of life. And I would like to connect that, but first of all say that this is legitimate. There is, there is not only the right, but even the responsibility of the faithful to manifest to pastors appropriately uh, whatever it is that they might become aware of that may be contrary to divine truth, divine revelation that there is a right and even a responsibility, at least in certain circumstances, to make manifest to a pastor when he may be wrong. An early example of this, which is scriptural or biblical, would be the case in which uh, St. Paul confronted St. Peter publicly over the matter of whether or not to take meals with, uh, with uh, with those who were Gentiles and ritually unclean. Now, you might say, well, that's an apostle to an apostle. Well, it's at least an apostle to the vicar of Christ, the very first pope. It sets a precedent. At any rate, it's a, it's a right, but can even be a responsibility. And what they are calling for, basically, in the open letter is for the bishops of the world to gather to examine, evaluate, assess some of the statements and actions of Francis of Rome to determine whether they truly are heretical and to provide him an opportunity to recant on these positions and suggest that if he remains obstinate on what would be manifestly heretical, that they should uh, rightly uh, discern and declare 
that he has rendered himself incapable of being Pope. There is no authority here on earth above the Pope. God is over the Pope. The Pope answers to the Vicar of Christ. But there's no authority here, even among the bishops and cardinals, to simply uh, judge by way of having juridical power and authority to, if you will, impeach him and put him out of office by their authority. What they can do is discern whether or not a pope, any pope, has in effect vacated the office himself by, in this case, heretical statements and actions, in which case they have not themselves by their authority removed him from office. He has removed himself, and they have the authority to assess this and to declare it to be so. That's a very important distinction in all of this. But at any rate, to tie it to this allegory, basically Jesus Christ says that the sheep will recognize the good shepherd. They will hear his voice. They will respond when the good shepherd calls and speaks to them. And what these theologians are saying, and so many others are saying as well, is when he speaks, when Francis speaks, we don't hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. When Francis says that someone can remain actively an adulterer and be right with God and with the church, we don't hear that as the voice of the Good Shepherd. The voice of the Good Shepherd had something quite the opposite to say about the sin of adultery. Or when Francis says something about perversion uh, and, uh, and, and actions that go with that, and it doesn't resonate, what these theologians and others are saying is, we don't hear the Good Shepherd. We don't see the Good Shepherd in what you're saying and what you're doing. That's what's happening. So they put it out there to the bishops who are shepherds with the implicit hope that they will act like shepherds and not like hirelings who will flee from the situation, who will ignore it, who will do nothing. Very much this allegory is very relevant for today. And in your prayers, and I believe your prayers are powerful, I ask that you would spiritually support this endeavor to raise the legitimate questions that these prominent theologians have, and now they have much more support from many others who have signed on to this, have raised the questions and put this open letter and this challenge to the shepherds who are the bishops. Bishops, will you be shepherds or will you be hirelings? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost.